Okay, so we have to, we have to take care of some business first. That is, um, before I say all my thank yous, you've got to understand that both Kai and Neil were my teachers. This is what you've got to, under, you got to understand this. Um, I've been fortunate enough to surround myself with the smartest people on the planet, which gives the impression that I know a lot. But all I do is just absorb. Um, what Neil didn't mention, part of our correspondence was, was debate about, you know, we'd have these debates about C.L.R. James and George Padmore and others, and I was learning so much from Neil. I mean, you know, when he was an undergrad, then he went to graduate school and we continued our conversation. So I learned so much. Kai, the same thing. There's so much that I learned in our conversations in my office, in reading Kai's work. I mean, some of those early papers were just incredible. And then what you may or may not know is that he has this book that's going to be coming out eventually, which is the most amazing history of the sort of the queer archive of black Los Angeles. I um, mean, it's just incredible work. So I'm lucky that I get to know all these people and learn from these people. Um, and so for that, I'm very, very appreciative. Um, I'm also appreciative, you also hype me up in, in a way that it's, that's going to make things really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and so don't get your hopes up. And if you have to leave early, I know some of you are going to hear some debates. Go hear those debates. Um, uh, and let me first of all thank all the people who organized this event. Um, I want to also honor the land that we're on. Uh, the university, like every university, uh, sits on stolen land, no matter whether it's a land grant institution or not. <laughs> Um, and I don't want this to be like just an empty ritual, but you know, whenever I say these things, I want us to think about, about it as an opportunity to think about decolonization um, and the ways to repair and to restore the relationship between indigenous peoples and the land. Um, because you know, dispossession is not just about property. Um, dispossession is spiritual theft. Uh, it's a disruption of history and our relationship with the ancestors who still occupy this land. Because it's not like ancestors are not, well, they're not gone, they're, they're here, they're right around us. So as long as we treat land as property, and this is the tricky thing, if we treat land as property, that is with legal ownership and borders and boundaries to be policed and surveyed and surveilled, we can't begin to think about decolonization if decolonization is about repair. Um, so when, when you leave here, think about that rather than just see this as a kind of, um, you know, common ritual of saying, you know, we acknowledge that this is stolen land and just go b about our business. Um, it's so great to see Professor D.L. Smith, who I've also known, who's a teacher of mine. Um, many years, we were all part of this thing called the Jazz Study Group. And that's my other world. And I, I have to say that listening to that music and learning from that music and learning from Professor Smith has just, you know, just made my life so much better, I have to say. So I'm very fortunate. Um, OK, so let me just begin. And by the way, um, Neil will tell you that I was working on this talk like five minutes before I walked in the door. Um, it's not done. So it's a little bit rough around the edges, but, but part of the problem is that I do this thing where I get invited, um, I'm too busy to respond to emails, I kind of forget that I have this talk coming up, then, then, then people say, well, we need a title, give us a title, at least for publicity. So I come up with a title, not knowing what I'm gonna talk about. So now I, had to, I was on the plane last night trying to figure out, well, what is that title again? What am I talking about? <laughs> so I wanna show you a picture first. And by the way, I realize because time is short and we're already way behind, I'm not going to talk about everything I plan to talk about. I'd much rather end on the early side so we have time for conversation. So I'm going to give myself, um, we're supposed to be out by, you said 5.30, right? I'm, I'm going to try to talk for about 34 minutes. OK, so you may recognize the, that picture. Um, to the left is a, uh, a brother named Maurice Stollard. Um, and to the right is uh, Vicki Lee Jones. They were murdered in Louisville, Kentucky, at a Kroger's recently on October 24th. 
Um, we know a lot about um, the killer. Uh, that is Gregory Allen Bush. But we know very little about the victims. And I want to talk about, I want to begin there, because I want to dedicate my remarks this evening not only to their memory, but I also want to begin there because they are part of the 68 generation, the 1968 generation. We're, I'm talking about 1968. If you don't know the titles, like two, the two sides of 68. Um, and I want to begin there because they were both born and raised either in Louisville or at the outskirts of Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky is a very important city. Um, some of you know it as the home of Muhammad Ali. Uh, most of us don't realize that it was one of the most militant places and still is in terms of anti-racism, in terms of labor struggles, and, and they're a product of that. So let's, who, who are these people? So Maurice Stollard was born May 16, 1949. He retired from General Electric, uh, Electric as a worker. He was a veteran. Um, in fact, when he was shot and killed, he was with his 12-year-old grandson looking for a poster board for a project that he had to do. And he was shot in the back of the head. And this is Jefferson Town, Kroger. Uh, he is the father of Kelly Watson. Kelly Watson is the um, chief equity officer of the Louisville Metro government very progressive, um, working on racial equity issues and policy and budgeting. Uh, you know, Vicki Lee Jones was born February 2nd, 1951 in Jeffersontown. Uh, she attended Western Kentucky University. That's where she met her husband, George Jones. And he passed away about eight years ago from cancer. Uh, she worked for many years as an as a office administrator for the VA hospital. And she retired, so they both retired. Now, when I said that Stollard and Jones uh, were products of the 68 generation, I really meant that, and that Louisville was, was a center of the global insurgency. In May of 1968, protests over what was considered um, the unauthorized arrest of two uh, African-American men, uh, as well as a lot of struggles over open housing, uh, that is the right to be able to rent uh, housing without racial barriers, uh, exploded, you know, in 68, in a full-scale rebellion. And that rebellion lasted about a week, at the end of May. They had to bring in about 2,000 National Guard. Uh, 472 people were arrested. Um, about 119 properties were burned. I mean, this is Louisville. And two uh, young African-American, I'd say boys, uh, were killed. Um, James Groves, Groves was only 14 years old when he was killed by police. And uh, Matthias um, Washington Browder was the other victim. So when Louisville erupted, uh, Jones, who then went by the name Vicki Lee Broomer, was just finishing um, as a junior, finishing her junior year at Shawnee High School. And Stollard had just had graduated from high school the year before from, um, from Mail High and was on his way to Vietnam. Six activists uh, were arrested during this, this rebellion and charged with conspiracy. And it became, um, you know, not just a regional issue, but a national issue. And they were, the, the six who were arrested were known as the, the Black Six. So this campaign started out to free the Black Six. They finally came to trial two years later, 1970, Ultimately, the charges were reduced to disorderly conduct, but not without the state of Kentucky actually um, tightening repression. Uh, in fact, the state of Kentucky in that March of 68 created a joint legislative committee on un-American activities. This is 68, it's not 58, you know. Um, and they were basically uh, investigating anyone associated with civil rights, black power, social justice, you know, that sort of thing. Um, they waged war on a variety of racial justice and black power groups, including longtime activists in, um, in Louisville, Anne and Carl Braden, two white uh, activists who'd been involved in racial justice for a very long time. Uh, meanwhile, black student militancy in Louisville grew at the University of Louisville, 
uh, at uh, Bellarmine uh, College, Jefferson Community College, um, and they formed groups like the Black Student Coalition of Louisville and demanded self-determination for black people. Uh, Western activists formed groups such as the Black United Brothers or Our Black Thing, um, and then there was a group called the Louisville Junta of Militant Organizations, or, or JOMO. And I'm sure that, has anyone ever heard of this organization? Of course not. <laughs> this is exactly the point. So JOMO emerges, and, and they had members of the Republic of New Africa, which I'm going to talk about at the end, um, come through Louisville. And JOMO was uh, founded in May 1968 uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, and it became a kind of regional uh, outfit, very much like the Revolutionary Action Movement. So when JOMO itself um, declared themselves a Marxist-Leninist organization calling for revolution of people of color against uh, the white Western bourgeoisie, they characterized the black condition as a condition of colonialism or internal colonialism. And in 1970, uh, Jomo established in, in Louisville the Institute of Black Unity, which was housed in the offices of, of the Southern uh, Conference Educational Fund, which was the organization um, led by Ann Braden and Carl Braden, SCEF. So imagine, you got this black nationalist organization, an institute in uh, a multiracial uh, organization whose main leaders were two anti-racist white people. And they organized Black Solidarity Week and a bunch of other things in the 70s. Now, I've only touched the surface of what is a really long and rich and incredible history of Louisville, uh, in part, um, and the reason why I mention this and we begin here is not only just to recognize their lives uh, and that they're a product of these struggles, but also because in all of our commemorations of 1968 this year, you know, this is 2008, 50th anniversary, 68, it's almost as if everything happened in Paris, Chicago, maybe the Bay Area, you know? And the South, the, the US South, let alone the Global South, just disappears. And, and this is what I want to talk about. Now, keep in mind, Memphis will make an appearance because that's where Dr. King was killed. But then, what was he doing there? He was, he was supporting, I wouldn't say organizing, he wasn't organizing, he was supporting um, one of the most important um, public worker strikes in the country. And that's another side story, but I mean, I should tell the side story, I got a minute. Um, of course, we know what happened with the Memphis sanitation workers. It was a hard fought struggle. Um, at this, around the same time, at least a couple years later, um, Atlanta had a sanitation worker strike. I don't know if you know the story. Uh, under a black mayor, and they broke the union. Remember that? Just remember that. What do you mean? They broke the union. In other words, under a black mayor, they said, we're not negotiating, and they crushed the sanitation workers. Under, because uh, keep in mind, this is the New South. The New South is emerging classes, and this is what Walter Rodney talks about, and I'll get to that. There are emerging classes of leadership, black leadership, that are adopting the, the post-segregationist South, whose position when it comes to black workers is one that's essentially a neoliberal position. That is, um, you, you maximize profits, you reduce labor costs, and if you have to break a union, break a union. That's Maynard Jackson. See, so we, I, I say that as, pref as preface, uh, kind of uh, preface for what I'm about to talk about this afternoon or this evening. So anyway, that's a side note. But the main thing is that um, when we think about uh, the South, the U.S. South, this typical story is this is vibrant civil rights movement. It's emerging, it's flowering. Then you get the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You see, you've seen the movie Selma. Selma ends on victory. Yes, we got, the vote. we got the vote, we're done. And then the next story is Dr. King gets in a caravan, flies to Chicago, and he's there in the struggles in the North. And then there's Watts, and then there's Detroit, and then there's Washington, D.C., and then the South disappears. And I want to challenge that because I want to make the argument, something that my teacher, Cedric Robinson, taught me. He says that the South was always the vanguard in the 1860s, in the 1960s, and in the 21st century, okay? 
Um, so I want to return to the South because by looking at the U.S. South in 68, and I, I'm only going to give like a couple of examples, and the global South in 68, I think they have a lot more in common than we think, at least in terms of its neocolonial relationship to multinational capital, the question of land, uh, the suppression of democracy, and in some ways, the question of race and democracy. Um, the South keeps coming back. Um, and by turning our attention to the two Souths, that is the US South and the global South, I want to remind us of the long radical tradition in the South, which is so quickly dismissed by smug liberal Democrats like the people who live in my state, California, who talk about succeeding. Really? In the state that has more prisoners than any other place except for Texas? Really? In the, in the, in the state that actually voted, uh, where two thirds of the population voted against um, rent control, Proposition 10? I mean, really? Like, these people make me so tired, although, although I'm going back because it's warm. Um, but having said that, um, they, they blame the South for Trump's victory, right? When it's in the South that the fights are so intense. And we see that now in the gubernatorial races, certainly in Atlanta and Florida, we see it. Um, they blame the South. And they're also kind of quick to accept um, unwittingly, unwittingly, uh, Donald Trump's uh, characterization of the global South as shithole nations, right? So when we talk about the third world, I have people say, well, what is third world? Third world used to be a, a badge of pride, honor. But now it's like, associated with poverty and, and backwardness, right? So I think revisiting the spirit of 68 in the two Souths might help us explain how we got to the point we're in. What we lost with the defeat of the revolutionary insurgencies, which I think hold important lessons for where we go from here, especially among people who think that the blue wave is revolution. It's not. Some of you may think that. You know, I come from the, the, the other red wave. You know, it's another red wave. <laughs> Some older people know about that. Um, in any case, I'm really interested in challenging the narrative that the movement shifted from south to north around 65, since the southern question was then resolved, and, and, you know, and yet what we're looking at are, you know, post-1968 are kind of radical, often nationalist, often armed struggles focused on land, bread, justice, and freedom, erupting in places like Mississippi and Louisiana, um, but also identifying uh, or being identified with what's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Southern Africa and Palestine and elsewhere. I also want to suggest that the new international economic order, which I'll say a couple words about, um, which we associate with third world elites, was in fact as much a response to domestic insurgencies in those nations uh, and fear of revolution as it was a response to neocolonial finance and the debt regime and OPEC. So much the same could be said about the radical struggles in the US South, uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and et cetera. So that's what I want to do. Now, let's, let me, um, oh, by the way, I meant to show you this picture. This is um, just a picture of Louisville under occupation in 1968. OK, okay. so let's begin with, with one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King. His ideas become, of course, more radical in 68. Uh, he, oh, you know what? I have this, this technology, right? <laughs> Clicker, oh my goodness. Okay, I forgot about this. So he and, and Coretta uh, really stood steadfast against the Vietnam War um, in 60, really 66, when you begin to see opposition to the war from, from the King family. Coretta much before um, uh, Martin. And you know, all, and they're, op they're opposed to all forms of US interventions while also championing third world revolutions, which Dr. King regarded as a wave of a global democratic future. In his famous uh, Beyond Vietnam speech delivered exactly um, you know, April 4th, 1968, uh, I'm sorry, April 4th, 1967, correct that. Um, he, he warned that our very survival depends on shifting from what he calls a thing-oriented society 
to a person-oriented society. Uh, he called for a revolution in values in order to challenge what he calls the triplets of racism, militarism, and um, materialism. So for an author like George Custer, Kastifakis, uh, he wrote this book called The, the Global Imagination of six, 1968. And by the way, there's a new reprinted version of that book. I would really urge you to read that book. It's a very important book. And he focuses on the rise of the new left as a world historical development in 68. And therefore, his analysis examined what he calls the core of the world system to illuminate the possibility of such world historical revolution. And in doing so, uh, he basically identified um, certain characteristics of these insurgencies. And here are five of them. Uh, one is opposition to racial, political, and patriarchal domination, as well as to economic exploitation, uh, a concept of freedom um, as not only freedom from material deprivation, but also freedom to create new human beings. And here the emphasis is on new identities, on, on creating new, uh, new cultures. Uh, in, in opposition to consumer culture. So much of what we think of as identity politics in a very positive way is about recognizing identities that can't be reduced uh, to class or to economics. Um, the extension of democracy and expansion of individual rights, uh, not their constraint, right? That we would have new expanded rights, uh, new forms of democracy, including economic democracy. Um, in large base of revolution that is not limited to class conflict or class struggle framework of the proletarian identification, but really to incorporate what he calls the middle strata as well as the so-called lumpen, lumpen meaning those who are sort of pushed outside of the, the economy on the edges of it. Um, not just hustlers, by the way. People think lumpen all hustlers. Some, some lumpen are just like homeless people struggling. In any case, um, and of course, an emphasis on, di on direct action. Going back to, to King for a second, um, this kind of powerful, capacious definition of a global new left imagination uh, is really useful. Um, I'm skeptical of the degree to which there's global solidarity and, and coordination, but nevertheless, it's a really useful definition. But why, I want to go back to King because, as I said, King said we needed a revolution of values. And that was going to be the future. And he was right about one thing, that there was a revolution in values. It's just not the white revolution. Okay? So instead, what revolution did we get? We get the neoliberal revolution, uh, placing an, uh, an ethical imperative for justice, which was King's vision and the vision of the global new left. Instead of that, we got neoliberal reason. That is the idea that market principles should govern all spheres of life, and therefore virtually everything should be privatized outside the domain of the state. Um, we get personal responsibility and family values uh, replacing the very idea that there's a social, that the social is us, the social is the, the, the collective. And that is to say that the nation um, is responsible for collectively providing for those in need. In other words, the elimination of all expectations of state provisions will somehow make us more responsible for ourselves and enhance competition and productivity. Uh, and, and the fact that we come up saying things like, you know, I got to protect my brand. I mean, do you really have a brand? Do you know what a brand is? Brand comes from marking animals and human beings as property. Like, really? Do you want to say that? If you tweet that again, take it back. <laughs> eliminated, okay? So the state is not eliminated, rather it continues to take on course of functions. Um, and this idea of, of um, no society, this is Margaret Thatcher, um, this is Ronald Reagan, this is, you know, um, what we think of as neoconservative, but specifically neoliberal kind of conception. Um, and the other thing is it takes on the identity, uh, the state takes on the identity of a corporation or a firm with managerial functions. And so in that particular political formulation, you actually don't need a president, you need a CEO. <laughs> so democracy and accountability are replaced by the norms of good management, efficiency, effectiveness, profitability. OK, so I want to go back. It was not inevitable. <laughs> 
The neoliberal revolution was not inevitable. And this is, I really want to emphasize this. This was a struggle. I want to suggest that we think of 68 not as like the pinnacle of global insurgencies or the beginnings of a right-wing turn with Nixon's election. In fact, we think about 68 as like a contested terrain where the future's not clear, right? It's still not clear. The future's still not, we're not done yet, right? Um, so it's not as if, like this idea, this kind of narrative that we often get in our history courses where the country uh, makes a right turn as if somehow before that moment in 68, it was progressive. <laughs> That's one of the <laughs> biggest, like we're already moving in this progressive direction and all of a sudden it turns. Remember, 68 is the battle to turn the country into a radical direction. And it, was a, it failed, it was defeated, but not permanently, okay? So, okay, and I wanna say a little more about that. So if you think of this as contested visions of the future, that, that 68 marks that moment of contestation. Some won, some lost. Some aspects of 68 vision actually won, much of it lost. Um, then what we could do is we could think of that moment as at least four competing visions. Um, one would be the dominant Keynesian welfare warfare state, because that's the direction that America was moving in at the time. There's also the neoliberal vision I just outlined, the social conservatism, and then the other one, which is I associate with the spirit of 68, is a radical, a radical democracy. A radical democracy based on economic, racial, gender, uh, justice, a national sovereignty. I love that song, thinking about freedom as sovereignty. That's beautiful, perfect. Um, Self-determination and sexual freedom. That these are the kinds of demands that end up on that list that George Kostavakis was, was uh, establishing. Um, in other words, this last thing, the struggle for radical democracy, was not a call for reform. It was a call for revolution. Uh, it was backed by, uh, you know, um, people who were in some ways at the edge or excluded or dispossessed. The 68 generation of activists had come to see that the system could not be fixed but had to be overthrown. And this is the most important thing, and if you want to write down anything, write this down. They saw liberalism as a failure. Liberalism was the problem. Why? How, come, why, how could I say that? Well, what's the context? Um, now, I don't know. Actually, I'd had some other slides, and I took them out. So imagine is a picture of an anti-war demonstration. Um, <laughs> so there's the war in Vietnam. The key here is that liberals, not conservatives, were responsible for escalating the war and expanding U.S. imperial power. And that war was shrouded in lies and misrepresentations. Don't get confused. I'm not saying that conservatives were against the war. No. They just weren't not the ones in power. They supported the war. They pushed for even more war. But remember, this is the Johnson administration. The war on poverty and the war on Southeast Asia, as well as the war in Dominican Republic and Brazil, and you know, we let's go on, we talk about Cuba, Chile, Southern Africa, Indonesia, we can go on and on and on. Liberals were behind that, right? They felt there were important wars. The other thing, you have a massive expansion of universities due to federal subsidies, population growth, general affluence, um, and those universities become the staging grounds for this revolutionary insurgency. It doesn't mean it's everybody, but again, if you got 10%, that's a lot, right? So that's also part of it. Um, this is also, uh, in some ways, a reaction to certain things that are happening in modern society. The pressures to conform, the pervasiveness of mindless consumer society, what Herbert Marcuse critiqued in his book, One Dimensional Man, um, a, a response to anti-communism as a way of life, uh, the, the threat to constant nuclear war, uh, the threat to ecological destruction, which is very, very clear. I mean, Rachel Carson's book comes out in 1962. It's, this is not a new thing. This is something that's really escalating. And increased sexual and gender repression. So this is what people are responding to and making demands for a bigger, more open society. The civil rights movement plays a role, has a profound effect on a new generation of young people who experience, whose experiences in the South shattered their illusions about what American freedom means. See, they grew up in this age of anti-communism, 
uh, where freedom was in some ways a, this negative thing. And they began to think of freedom differently uh, in the context of being working in Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana. And it put them in contact with a lot of white intellectuals and other intellectuals and young students coming to Mississippi Free Summer, for example, Freedom Summer. They were in contact with black intellectuals who had long advocated radical changes in both American society and movements for change. When I say intellectuals, I don't mean formal intellectuals. Some were, but some were like Fannie Lou Hamer or Anita Blackwell, people like that. Uh, Ella Baker, who are thinking about these things and really laying out a different vision of society. They also faced and had to, to, uh, to deal with mass urban unrest. Um, in the midst of the great society, the war on poverty, uh, the success of all the civil rights legislation you get between 1964 and 72, 300 cities blowing up. You know, Watts being the epicenter of urban rebellion. Police and National Guard turned um, black neighborhoods into war zones, arresting at least 60,000 people, employing tanks, machine guns, tear gas to pacify the community. So whenever people start talking about um, posse comitatus and, and all the stuff about how you can't really use uh, domestic military for domestic um, problems, well, in this case, this is insurgency. That's where you had the most usage of of domestic armed forces in the United States. And finally, you have the war on poverty. And this is a picture of, of, of Resurrection City in Washington, DC. Now, the fact that a country as wealthy as the United States, the self-proclaimed leader of the free world, was actually racked with poverty and deepening inequality kind of created a crisis of legitimacy for the United States. Um, so think about this. You have great society liberalism. Uh, which, by the way, is the brainchild of American liberal intellectuals, not Johnson's empathy for the poor. Um, but that great society liberalism was not, and I repeat, was not antithetical to militarism. They went hand in hand. You know, Dr. King was disturbed, as he would, should be, that he's spending you know, all this money to kill Vietnamese and just a paltry sum of money to fight the war on poverty. Nevertheless, the war on poverty was accompanied by what? The expansion of police, the expansion of prisons, um, and the expansion of war. And it is precisely out of US Cold War imperatives of extending foreign aid to third world countries as a way to solve the problem of poverty abroad that poverty at home came to be understood. And there's a wonderful uh, essay by Alyosha, actually a book, Alyosha Goldstein talks about this. He talks about how you know, poverty was associated in the early 1960s with foreignness, with, you know, domestic, you know, that is to say that, you know, that the poor within the domestic borders are poor because they're different. Uh, the ghetto, the barrio, the reservation, and Appalachia were constantly represented as a different country, another country, isolated and beyond the dominant values of US society. Um, and so, in some ways, Michael Harrington's book, The Other American, he was a left, he was a new left person. Uh, and he, he was a liberal. And he's not necessarily condemning that, but again, the metaphor that he's using is the other America, the foreign America, the America that we need to use the same tactics that we use to solve the problem of poverty in Colombia or Ethiopia that we're going to apply to these particular regions. Now, what does that mean? It means that poverty is a problem of isolation. It's a problem of values. It's not a problem of the market. It's not a problem of capitalism. So you've got, and I'm making a big leap here, um, the idea is that if you can simply train people, uh, give them skills, teach them how to be good consumers and good workers, good Americans, make them no longer foreign, that somehow, because the market is so robust, because capitalism is so inclusive, they're just going to rise up. And we know that's not what happened. The National Welfare Rights Organization, the Poor People's Campaign, um, disagreed. They said it is a problem of wages. It is a problem of not having living wage jobs. It's a problem of, of, of discrimination in employment. It is a problem of discrimination in labor unions. It is a problem of, of basic income. It's a problem of gender discrimination. Uh, and in fact, it's also worth noting, just a side note, that Dr. King and Rev. Reverend Abernathy's inspiration for 
the war in power for, for their own poor people's campaign came not from Chicago, but from Mississippi. But they were in Mississippi when they decided to, to wage that war. Again, the South. What I just described, of course, mirrors the global South's response to poverty. So in short, what liberals faced in the streets, on university campuses, sometimes in the fields and factories, was a revolutionary insurgency and a disavowal of liberalism. Okay? And if we were to take that story and extend it out to the rest of the world and say, what does 68 look like globally? Then the truth of the matter is that if you tally up all the revolts, the revolutions, the people's wars, the rebellions, the riots, then from 1968 to 1971, the vast majority of 68 you know, insurgencies are coming from the global south, not from Europe, not from the United States. That's where most of it. I mean, the Philippines, Thailand, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Iran, the whole Arab world, Tunisia, Egypt, Iraq, Turkey, Palestine, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Brazil, Chile, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, uh, the Bahamas, Bermuda. I mean, you can go on and on. And on. In fact, the massive strikes and street, uh, street demonstrations that erupted uh, in Curaçao, in Bermuda, in the Bahamas, in Jamaica, Trinidad, Aruba, Anguilla, uh, in 1968, 69, and 70, these were people's revolts. These were, the, we had a general strike, for example, in Trinidad that almost overthrew Eric Williams' regime um, in 1970. And with that, I'm just going to share one story. Um, I don't think I have, I don't have a slide for that one. Uh, I was going to, but I ran out of time. But Walter Rodney, and I think I might as well do this because you have Walter Rodney on the poster. <laughs> Um, so I got to talk about Rodney. So often, some of you know about what's called the Rodney Riots in Jamaica. And there's sort of a, this idea that somehow Walter Rodney, well, who's Walter Rodney? Walter Rodney was one of the great historians. Um, he studied African history. He uh, was uh, from Guyana. He studied in London, um, ended up um, getting a PhD taught at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, but also at one point in 1968 in January, he got a gig teaching at the University of West Indies Mona campus. So, then, so, so he shows up. And so part of my point is that when Rodney showed up, um, there was already a black power movement emerging. Uh, he didn't invent it. And so part of the mythology is that you know, Rodney comes to Jamaica and he starts black power and everyone's following him. It's not really true. Um, there's a young Rastafarian named uh, Robin Jerry Small who launched a monthly periodical called Black Man Speaks in 68, and he was part of a group of young radicals who were students at Jamaica College, and Jamaica College was actually a high school in Kingston. Um, and so you had this publication plus our own and other publications that are emerging at a time when the Jamaican government banned the writings of black power uh, uh, advocates like Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, and Malcolm X. Malcolm X was banned in Jamaica, you know, in 68. It's interesting because I mean, I, as a kid, I went there in 69, visit family, and I didn't know that. You know, all I knew is that the, the popular song on the radio was a song called Sister Big Stuff. You know, it's another story. <laughs> anyway, so you can, if you read um, this wonderful book of, of essays, uh, and I know um, uh, Professor Roberts teaches this book, uh, The Groundings with My Brothers by Walter Rodney. Um, you see essays that kind of, that are in some ways summaries or actual speeches that he gave uh, to the people who are living outside of the university world. I mean, Rastafarians, working class people, the unemployed. He spoke wherever he spoke and he went everywhere. And he has a wonderful critique of the Jamaican state in an essay called Statement of the Jamaican Situation. And then he has also a very class analysis uh, in his essay, Black Power, Basic Understanding. Anyway, the story is that he goes to this Black Writers Con Conference in Montreal, gives a speech, he comes back to Jamaica and they don't let him in the country because they see him as a threat. Uh, and, you know, and he's banned from entering. Students at University uh, uh, West Indies organize a march. About 2,000 people show up. They're not all students. Some are Rastafarians. Some are workers, unemployed. The police attack. Violence erupts. Cars are overturned. 
And soon it became clear that this was not about academic freedom. This wasn't just about Rodney. This was a, an expression of class anger. As businesses were targeted, they hit the Canadian Imperial Bank of, Com of Commerce, which I would have hit too, just by the name. Um, <laughs> the Bank of London uh, and the Bank of Montreal, Pan American uh, Airlines, Woolworth, all attacked. And they protested recent fare hikes by overturning and burning 53 buses. Um, so in other words, this is an insurgency. And I just give that as a quick example of one of many of these kinds of rebellions and riots which actually have an economic foundation. Um, out of that, and um, I realize my time is running out, um, OPEC, no, out of that, um, I just want to make one, one big general statement and, and then turn to Mississippi and I'll end. Um, those kinds of rebellions of 68, I argue, are foundational for what comes later. By 1974, you get something called the New International Economic Order. Um, and that is a group of 77 Global South countries, the G77, which puts out a declaration demanding economic sovereignty of the post-colonial states. And they're calling for things like an absolute right of states to control the extraction and marketing of their domestic natural resources. They're calling for the establishment and recognition of state-managed resource cartels to stabilize uh, in, in commodity prices, like OPEC, for example. Uh, they want regulation of transnational organizations. They want uh, technology transfers without strings attached from global north to global south. They want preferential uh, trade preferences um, for countries of the global south. And they also want debt forgiveness. You know, and what they're also sort of implying is that we, are, we were colonies for all these years and extraction of wealth came from us. And so therefore, we're all at a bad footing and so we want some kind of equity. Uh, and it should be clear that the new international, new international economic order wasn't opposed to trade. Um, they weren't even opposed to free trade, but they wanted certain rules that would uh, manage international trade in order to maintain global balance. A uh, short story is, and I'm going to skip over a lot of this, is that in response to the G77, you get the G7. And the G7 is like, we're gangsters of the global north, and you can't come to us asking for fairness in the system, because that's not how it works. And that's how the G7 is born. But my point is that some of the elites who push forward for the new international economic order were concerned about their own people. They didn't want bread riots. They didn't want the banks in Jamaica or in Barbados or in, you know, they didn't want those banks being burned. They wanted to manage their own rebellion. So that's part of the story. Now I want to make a quick turn to the domestic. Let's see. Um, let's see, that's the National World for Rights Organization. I did have a slide for that. Um, and I want to just quickly end by talking about Mississippi, because um, I think Mississippi is the most important state in the nation right now. Um, and I think it has been for a long time, uh, not just because Mike Epsi may become a uh, senator. There's other reasons. Um, this is Mexico, by the way. I had some things about Mexico. I'm skipping that because time is short. So believe me, Mexico was important. Um, so I want to return to uh, Mississippi because, again, we think of Mississippi in terms of 64, Freedom Summer, the, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's stand in Atlantic City. But at the same time, uh, you know, the year after the march on Selma, the year after the Voting Rights Act is um, passed, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, organized the Mississippi Freedom Labor Union, right? Mm -hmm. And organized a lot of agricultural workers in the Delta. We think of SNCC as sort of civil rights, um, but they're not interested in desegregation. What they're interested in is, is economic and social justice. And so part of what they do was organize a strike in, in spring of 65. 350 members of the union, cotton choppers, went on strike to demand $1.25 an hour. In January uh, 1966, they took over the Greenville Air Force Base, which was about to be sold. Um, and strikers occupied it. This, this, this is occupied Mississippi in an attempt to focus federal attention on their plight. And the Air Force expelled them but they fought this fight. And strikers finally created what they called Tent City, known as Strike City, and appealed to liberal organizations and the government to, to send food, clothing, basic commodities so they could survive. Um, my point is that this sets us up 
for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party as this radical um, organization fighting for economic justice. If we, and I'm skipping over some stuff, but if you just look at what their 68 platform is, they're not dead after 64. They just continue to live. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer dies in 1977. She never abandons that organization. But in any, in any case, they had a different agenda than the mainstream party. The, the, when, when the Democratic Party in Mississippi became the interracial Democratic Party, it incorporated some of the black elites, like Charles Evers and others. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party did not give up their prerogative to exist as an independent organization. And so this is what they pushed for. Guaranteed annual income, that is basic income. Extended daycare, um, paid for by the state and federal government. Com comprehensive medical care. Increased federal provisions for food stamps. Right? Free higher education. Bernie Sanders didn't come up with that. You know, I mean, really. They were, they were thinking that in Mississippi, okay? In Mississippi. End to the Vietnam War and end to all compulsory military service as in the draft. A renewed diplomatic ties with Cuba and China, right? An embargo on arms to South Africa and specifically Israel, with all Middle East, which would include Saudi Arabia, right? But by 1968, even the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party came across as kind of reformist uh, because of some of their relationships to the Democratic Party. So we jump forward by six, the 68 generation, early 70s, you begin to see the emergence of something that looks like guerrilla warfare. That is armed self-defense, armed struggle in Mississippi in the late 60s. Um, Militants like John Buffington and Rudy Shields and others directly challenge the white power structure in Mississippi, both electorally and economically, for which that community faced violent retaliation and assassination. Uh, January 24, 1970, the office of Clay County Community Development was firebombed in response to a, a planned boycott of white businesses. Um, and, you know, so imagine that, right? And what, what was happening was that the white businesses were, um, uh, they, they were basically pushing for uh, uh, a really problematic school phony desegregation plan, which wasn't desegregation at all, but actually re-implementing segregation. The next day, in retaliation to the firebombing of the Clay County Community Development Corporation, which of course was run by uh, Buffington, um, Dynamite somehow was planted in the Clay County Courthouse and blew a hole in the concrete foundation. No one knows who did that. But this is what they were doing, waging guerrilla warfare. White supremacists come to them, they respond and they retaliate. Um, the police arrested Buffington and five other black activists, including John Thomas Jr., and charged them with conspiracy, much like the, the Black Six in Louisville. The charges didn't stick, but a few months later, Thomas was sitting outside in broad daylight and was assassinated by a white man. It's 1970. It was also the year that two students were killed by police amid protests in Jackson, Jack, Jackson State. Uh, May 13th, hundreds of students from Jackson State and also a Millsaps College, which was John White College, held anti -war, uh, an anti-racist protest for which they were gunned down. Um, there's other examples, Orangeburg, and we could talk about that. The final thing I want to segue to is that this is the context in which the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa began to settle in Mississippi. Some of you may know the story. It was founded in Detroit in March of 1968 by two brothers, Gaidi and Imari Obadeli. Um, they were born Milton and Richard Henry with support from a wide range of black radical activists, Queen Mother Audley Moore, Amiri Baraka, uh, Mabel and Robert Williams, Max Stanford, and others. And they had initially considered an electoral strategy to take over the Mississippi Delta and other black majority counties, and then build a movement to demand independence, that is, separation of Mississippi from the United States. Okay? The organization then developed a new strategy of organizing economic cooperatives, because they realized the electoral st strategy wasn't going anywhere, uh, building educational and medical institutions to serve the people, and ultimately, they were calling for a UN plebiscite to allow black people to vote for their independence, to decide. This new nation was identified um, as the Kush District. <laughs> it's a contiguous area of black majority counties 
in the western part of the state bordering Mississippi. And, this would, and the idea would they would win recognition from the international community as a republic of New Africa. Um, the social and economic organization of society would be along cooperative socialist lines. In other words, they're holding on to the 68 generation, the vision of global imagination, right, of 68, not the neoliberal one. Uh, to quote their own program, quote, all industry and agriculture are owned by the people as a whole and administered by the Republic of New Africa. People are trained and assigned work in accordance with their preference, their ability, and the needs in the community of, in, in the nation. After community needs are satisfied, wealth is equally divided among all workers. Um, so in any case, the provisional government for the Republic of New Africa established itself in Mississippi in 1970 with more members moving down to Jackson from Detroit and elsewhere uh, the following year. Um, their initial efforts to buy land were met by what? Violence. And they have money. They're not trying to steal land. They're not trying to seize land and force people out. They're not trying to dispossess anyone. They're trying to pay for it from black farmers. So the state steps in, vigilantes step in, the police and the FBI step in, and we know what happens next. That is, a war follows. The state's quest to interrogate, uh, then assassinate. They, they, they raided homes and headquarters. They incarcerated leaders of the RNA, resulting in the case of the RNA-11. Um, but there were also more casualties on the state side. And that, I, I don't have time to talk about that story, but there was a shootout between the RNA and the police. And the RNA were so well organized that they, had, they lost no casualties, but the state did. And they were arrested, and eventually, um, they ended up in, in prison. Um, there's another story which I don't, again, I'm going to skip over, uh, which just has to do with what the result was. Because even though the RNA uh, lost some of the battles for land, one of the reasons they lost was because of the planter block, as Clyde Woods talks about, literally pushed to, re to industrialize both agriculture and um, industry uh, in manufacturing. And so what you get in Mississippi is, you know, massive cotton farms using um, millions of pounds of toxins, pesticides. You got hazardous waste sites every, scattered everywhere. <clears throat> Petrochemical industries create Cancer Alley between Mississippi and Louisiana um, in the Delta, Baton Rouge. You've got all these things that have caused environmental havoc, uh, displacement, and dispossession in terms of capital movement. If you, you could look at the Green Revolution in Mississippi and look at the Green Revolution in India and look at the Green Revolution in other parts of the Global South, and it's the same story. And I won't go into that, but that's basically what happens. Nevertheless, despite that, the spirit of 68 prevailed in Jackson because in 2013, Chokwe Lumumba, the late Chokwe Lumumba, um, who came from Detroit, was one of the founders of the RNA, he, won, he became mayor of Jackson. His son, Chokwe Antar Lumumba, is currently the mayor of Jackson. Uh, and they, the way they won, we could talk about that, but Lumumba was a radical lawyer. Again, member of the New African People's Organization, member of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, and part of that first migration to, uh, to Mississippi from Detroit. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the Malcolm X grassroots movement developed something called the Jackson Plan, along the Cush Plan. And that is designed to build a base of autonomous power in Jackson that could serve as a catalyst for the attainment of black self-determination and democratic transformation of the economy. What did they do? Well, they tried to establish, and they're still trying to establish, a solidarity economy akin to the Mondragon a Corporation in Spain's Basque region through worker cooperatives. Uh, through eco-friendly community gardens, uh, through building inexpensive, energy-efficient housing, uh, developing community and conservation land trusts that will make land available to the community and house the homeless. Um, this is how they want to restore the commons. But the plan included a political strategy of creating people's assemblies, open meetings to discuss community needs, and ensure full democratic participation. And so that sort of thing. Um, we could talk more about that. And I'm just going to close. Uh, by just invoking, to, I want to close by saying that I don't want to, I'm not invoking the spirit of 68 out of nostalgia or a duty to commemorate 
uh, nor am I suggesting that we can ever return to that moment or reproduce the fervor and the belief that a new world was in the offing. On the contrary, I'm suggesting that it is hardly dead, that if you go to Mississippi right now, it's there. If you go to Newark, it's there. Uh, if you go to those who are crushed under the neoliberal movement in, in Detroit, it's still there. Um, the spirit of 68 is a specter, an unfinished revolution, haunting the current order. It haunts us even as neoliberalism and its offspring, liberal multiculturalism, seeks to rewrite the history of the moment. So I return to 68 as a counter to the normalization of the state of emergency we are currently facing. That's not the only alternative. And in truth, we've been facing some form of a, of, of a state of emergency in one form or another for the last three decades. Um, so we need to look back to see how these struggles looked ahead in order to produce a radically different future. And I also want to remind us finally in the academy that the revolutionary insurgencies of a half century ago made it possible for many of us to be here. And the spirits of those movements continue to haunt our work, the university, and our dreams. And in these dark times, we need to remember that the dream of revolution was rooted in what Dr. King called a dangerous unselfishness. The idea that we have no choice but to make a difference in the lives of the most vulnerable. Um, and that's what he talked about in his final speech before he died, a dangerous unselfishness. If we are to carry the spirit of 68, we have to create a university that doesn't just serve the needs of aggrieved communities, but draws on knowledge embedded in those communities. We have to become partners in knowledge production to maintain an organic relationship to social movements, the incubators of emancipatory thinking. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Robin D.G. Kelly. It's not just Robin Kelly, the D.G. Earned the D.G. today. Um, so we're slightly over, but you know, we're, we're going to, speaking of the Global South, we're going to work on creolized time. Um, but we have the room until, uh, until, see, oh, the alarm doesn't lie. We have a room until six. So what I would suggest um, uh, is that uh, we have a question and answer period of uh, 10 to 15 minutes and that we take two questions at a time. Um, there is a, uh, one of our students, where did he go? Oh, yeah, right here, um, who has a, uh, has a microphone. Uh, and so it, uh, if you could please uh, raise your hand and then ask your question into the microphone so that we can have it uh, as part of the recording. So, um, so the floor is open for questions. And again, we'll take two questions at a time. I guess, Robin, I'll let you, let you field it. And then, uh, and then in about 15, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll close out and there, uh, we'll have a book signing in the back. If anyone has to leave before that time, please, there are wonderful books uh, available, uh, but let's, uh, for the sake of time. Right. Okay, and by the way, we started at quarter two, so I didn't go that, I didn't yeah. go that one. Okay, yes, I'll, go, I'll take both of you. Um, hi. Yes, hi. It's on. Hello? No. Is it on? Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah, I think she, he needs it for that. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you would see, um, I guess, like Southern um, liberal and conservative existence as being, um, well, as coming from a similar origin as like um, moral conservatism in um, like the global South. And if so, um, could you see it as having the potential to grow to that same level of like prominence and oppression? Okay, what's the last part of it? Um, to go to the last? Could you see like uh, uh, the... Uh, sorry, the uh, Southern like conservative um, like existence as possibly growing to the same level of prominence as um, oh, in, in the in global South and right. our I see what you're world. Okay, good, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. Okay. They're related though. Um, but do you think there is a parallelism between the '68 rebellion? Um, and the recent election of Bolsonaro in Brazil, mm -hmm. and then the Maduro administration in Venezuela, and then going forward, how do you think marginalized groups should proceed um, in terms of like neoliberalism with that, I guess, like turning point, but not that you mentioned earlier? Right, in other words, overthrowing neoliberalism or operating within it. Okay. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the, the last, your first question is actually tied to your question in many ways. So just to make sure I understand it, part of the question is 
you know, whether or not the, the, the conservative tendencies in the U.S. South is similar to the conservative tendencies in the global South. And, you know, there are a lot of similarities, but again, it's very hard to think about similarities outside of time. So the very specific historical processes. So if you think about what does the so-called global South and the U.S. South have in common, these were uh, regions, at least in the Western Hemisphere, built around um, land possession, slavery, dispossession of indigenous peoples, and most importantly, forms of extractive industry and agriculture. And it just so happens that in places like in Brazil or Mexico or the U.S. South, uh, large land holdings um, and power in land was really, really important. Things changed, though. So imagine a place, a, a country like Mexico that after the revolution is able to develop something like a social, not something like, but develop a very robust social democracy around state ownership of, ext of extraction industries and, and of strong trade unions. And so in some ways, um, it's not that the old Latifunda, um, Latifundia uh, uh, class was killed. They, they continued to exist, but they existed alongside, um, especially in the 1930s and the Cardenas, a very strong social democratic uh, leadership. Uh, but then Mexico changes, and those changes have a lot to do with things like you know, global debt. The, the debt regime. It has to do with the fact that they're pumping oil and using oil as collateral for future and, and borrowing money on the, on the idea that oil prices remain high. Um, they're also being subjected to austerity, uh, IMF. And so that changes the circumstances in which conservative forces could emerge. So they're not the same old conservative forces. And the same thing with the U.S. South. Um, Clyde Woods a book, Development Arrested, is one of the most brilliant books ever written. It's an amazing book about Mississippi. And he shows that the old planter class continued to hold power, but their power changed as the economy changes and as other things begin to change. Now, the thing is, what is the old conservative rule? The old conservative rule doesn't always look, um, it doesn't always come from the same class, or the same fragment of a class, you know? Um, to make a leap to the question about Bolsonaro uh, and Maduro, I could say a little bit about Brazil, and that is that um, the, you know, there's the question of you know, what, what are the conservative forces, I say neo-fascist forces, that would give rise to like, someone like Bolsonaro, but then uh, what are the forces that would lead to an overwhelmingly popular election for him? And I think there are two different questions. Uh, you know, whether he gets support globally because his policies are very positive for the continued tr free trade policies that relate in, in, in to, to Brazil's economic strength. And by economic strength, that's not the same thing as, as reducing inequality, but, but it's, it leads to economic strength in relationship to, world, to global trade. So in some ways, he, he is the Trump choice. But I have to say, um, I don't think that, that a hard left candidate would be Obama's choice, you know, to be honest. I'm not saying Obama would support Bolsonaro, but if, if someone were like to the left of Lula, I don't think um, Obama would support, because to go back to the Maduro regime, um, that's a, that's a mess. That's a mess for lots of different reasons. It's a mess because there are authoritarian tendencies within state. Um, they haven't been able to provide basic social services. Some of that has to do with, with um, factors uh, that, that are external. Some have to do with internal factors. But what was Obama's position on Hugo Chavez? He couldn't stand him. I mean, he never said it out loud, but the Obama administration, if they could have overthrown Chavez, they would have. You know? So in some ways, um, the, the internal forces, the internal conservative reactionary forces within these nation states, um, as long as they're able to maintain the global trade regime, to maintain the dominance within the BRICS, that is, you know, Brazil, Russia, South Africa, India, China, um, and, and can sustain this kind of global economy, they'll be okay. Um, 
what we're see to me what's interesting, and this goes back to the other question about 68, this may not be the answer to your question, but um, I think that the insurgencies in opposition to Bolsonaro is definitely within that spirit of 68. Because uh, keep in mind that in Sao Paulo, they not only have a robust opposition, which didn't, it's not winning, but they elected the first trans woman to the state uh, legislature. I mean, that's a huge thing in Brazil. Um, they also have like really quite visionary radical organizations like MST, which is you know, the landless um, workers movement. Uh, and, and they're growing in size, but what we're seeing is intense battles and struggles and even violence between groups like MST and this new regime. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I do know that um, one of the things that is, is different between, say, 68 and now is that now we have this wave of authoritarianism that's outright and bald. In 68, what we saw were liberal regimes. De Gaulle was a liberal regime. The, the Kennedy's, I mean, uh, Johnson's liberal regime. Um, some exceptions were like Brazil, which was under dictatorship, but that was a dictatorship partly um, organized and manufactured by the United States and ITT, you know? Um, and what did we get in 1970? We get the election of uh, Allende in Chile, right? You also get the, 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 um, the anti-colonial struggles in Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, all of them based on a socialist model of development. And the, the anti-apartheid struggles of the ANC are also based on a socialist model. So that was, the, that was a movement that was dominant. And what happens in Jamaica? Jamaica, after the so-called Rodney riots and those uprising rebellions, you get Michael Manley elected. And he's considered to the left, you know? And that's another debate, but, but does that answer your question? That's a, a lot. Yeah, OK. So okay. Probably at the time to have one more set of one more pair of questions. Yeah, sorry, that was a big question. Or not a pair, another question? Yes. Hi, I wanted to uh, thank you so much for that fantastic talk. Okay. It was really wonderful mind blowing. Oh, you got a mic? Okay. Oh, thanks. Thank you for that uh, fine, uh, fantastic talk. It was really uh, uh, mind blowing. I certainly hadn't heard about the Republic of New Africa. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could share your thoughts um, about some of the arguments about what's different now about the way that um, the economic condition inter inter interacts with the conditions and form of oppression that we have now and the potential for revolution. Um, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the industrial base was just beginning to crumble and we had a lot more of a interlock between racism and capitalism where uh, people of color mattered as an alternative workforce right. to break strikes. Right. But now there's a lot of scholarship coming forward saying that we are at a, a very different moment where communities of color in the United States now are surplus labor. They're right. not needed. Right. So the economy now needs to act on them in a different way. And this is a transformative moment. So it could be a critical juncture for revolution right. or the coherence of a new form of capitalist right. uh, militarist oppression. Thank you. That's an, okay, should I take a second question? Is there, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then maybe make this is okay. the last one that. Right, I'll try. Yeah. I'm getting too uh, old to remember hi, this. Hi, thank you again for coming to speak and for all of the. Um, the amazing lessons you taught us and mm -hmm. the, your book, everything. Okay. Um, my question was kind of related. So in your presentation, you talked about how um, 1968 isn't dead and there's not really a sort of push to like, you know, the sort of exact fervor of 1968 isn't gonna be recreated. We can't like go back in time and pull that moment. Right. But there does seem to be some sort of radical potential, some sort of radical imagination in the coming, in the last few um, years, specifically the last few months, right. all, all around with the elections and just everything. So what sort of, what, what sort of fervor do you see? Or like what sort of 
radical whatever do you see coming, if anything? Right. Excellent. Those are two excellent questions, and they are connected. So let me begin with this one. Um, has, has anyone seen the film, Finally Got the News? OK, it's about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And it is a beautiful film. It was made in 1971. Um, and I think you see it online. But in Finally Got the News, it opens up with John Watson, who's a member of the League. And he's giving this, this lecture um, to the camera. And one of the things he talks about is exactly this issue, that uh, the, the, in specifically the black working class, and he's talking about Detroit, is essential. That if we all stop working, we could shut down production. Um, and this is exactly the point. And he lays it out. And what we know is that at that very moment, this is 1971, this is the beginning of the global slump. This is the beginning of restructuring of capital where you not only have more mobility of capital, but you have certain, um, uh, with the US going off the gold standard and with the global slump, the opportunity for greater capital mobility and seeking out cheaper labor elsewhere. Uh, whole manufacturing processes moving away. So as he's saying that, the potential for that power is disappearing, like literally as they're speaking. Um, it doesn't mean that manufacturing disappears from the U.S. because it actually is robust. To this day, the U.S. still manufactures more than almost any country except for China. You know, it still manufactures, but it's still not the kind of power, not nearly what you had. So you don't have the kind of opportunity where a uh, industrial strike could shut down production. Um, you also have, at the same moment, greater automation. And automation is, was a problem in the 70s, it's still a problem today, even as jobs become um, cheaper in terms of uh, their, their value, in terms of wage value, in terms of the, the percentage of, of wages to GDP keeps shrinking and shrinking. In other words, we're getting paid less and less and less for terrible jobs. Um, and even if those jobs are productive, uh, and automation is a, is a factor as well. So it is true. Um, that, dis, that opportunity disappears. Um, the question is whether, if we think of capital as global, whether or not those opportunities appear in other places. In other words, if you think about China as a massive manufacturer, but also in terms of finance, um, general strikes in China can make a huge difference but in a really repressive regime. But instead, the way we often think of China uh, in terms of the popular democratic discourse is as competitor. Not as another body of the working class, but as competitor. So when, when, when Obama, I remember, I'll never forget when he was debating, not McCain, but um, what's that idiot? Romney. Um, <laughs> he's debating Romney. And then Obama said something like, you know, I don't really care about Chinese workers. I want to make sure that our workers get a fair wage. That, a president could say that, but as someone concerned about the world, you want everyone's wages to rise, and you don't want to have sweatshop conditions. So what we're getting is a global sweatshop, the, the transformation of labor over the last 25 years in which a whole nations that were predominantly extractive, agricultural, are now low-wage manufacturing labor in tech, in garments, in you know, all these different things. And that is the working class. Um, they're not the competitors. The whole economic nationalism, which in some ways is just a chimera for what's behind it, and that is the real neoliberal, is, is to say that you know, there should be no boundaries around capital. Capital needs to be encased. Capital needs to flow. It's people that need to be bounded. But, but the chimera of economic nationalism to say, like, we really want to improve wages for Americans and move jobs back. They're not, no one's interested in that. They're not interested. In fact, what they're interested in, in creating jobs at even lower wages. And then again, to go back to Obama, one of Obama's big, um, the, the great bailout of GM meant a 50% wage cut for workers in GM and for those who are coming in who are not grandfathered in, to, who don't have um, seniority. So it was a terrible deal for workers, but that's where we are. So what's the good news? Is it good news? Is this some good news? And this is partly the answer to your question, but there's more to it. The good news is that in places where you have almost no visible means of economy, uh, the opportunities to create economy, 
worker-owned cooperatives, um, uh, using um, participatory budgeting to take control of city budgets, uh, to figure out ways to, and this is, this is a form of capitalism, it's a form of capital, but it's a capital accumulation that's based on cooperative ownership and, and basically trying to care for other people. So when we see this in Mississippi, uh, we see it, cooperative, uh, cooperative, cooperatively owned um, companies where people are using um, like 3D printers and things like that to make things, to manufacture things for need, uh, community gardens um, that are, are not necessarily make for, for commercial profit, but for you know, sustaining. So that's what we're witnessing, that in places of abandonment, the transformation of those abandoned lands and abandoned processes are potentials for new kinds of communities, new kinds of organization of production. The problem is that whenever they succeed, you get Detroit. And Detroit means that the people who created through abandonment, by taking advantage of abandonment, vibrant local economies, they're being dispossessed right now under new um, gentrification. Um, and because those lands were, were squatted, they were not necessarily owned. And so we get stuck again. That's why I go back to the whole question of what does it mean to have property? Um, so we have these opportunities, but every time you create an opportunity like that, you've got to be prepared for the state to come down on you. Be prepared for the very kinds of dispossessions and violences that we've witnessed for the last 500 years. And it's going to happen, which leads me to the, to the question. This is one of the really positive places. Um, I, I'm so enthusiastic about, about this younger generation of activists. Uh, they're better than any generation we've ever had. They're better than the 68 generation. And the reason why I say that is because they're attending to the very things that, um, in that list of five things, were often treated as lip service, mm -hmm. like gender, sexuality, you know, as part of what people are struggling for. That's not identity politics. That's about lifting forms of oppression off of people's backs so they could live, right? They're trying to figure out ways to love one another and make struggle and be participatory, which means you know, finding space for people to speak, to, find, to be heard, to new ways of learning, new ways of producing knowledge, and understanding that, you know, there's something better in life than becoming a cog in a neoliberal wheel. And there's a whole generation of people who are doing that and, and sacrificing in that way and creating kind of forms of community which are rich. The problem is, of course, they may not have means of production. They may not have like their fingers on a pulse where they could shut things down, but they have other ways to shut things down through forms of civil disobedience. Um, and by recognizing that the old way of thinking about democracy, that is democracy is simply being able to vote for a representative who you hope will do what you want them to do, is not working and there's gotta be new forms of democratic practice. And finally, this is a generation that is immensely uh, um, globally literate. And what I mean by that, you're talking about people who actually come from all over the world, who understand that you have to know the world. And, and that's what I get in my classroom. You know, I teach a class, 400 students, neoliberalism. And I got students from all over the globe. And they're really struggling with these questions in a way that's very, very serious. So I'm very hopeful. And that's why I don't want to say that people need to go back to 68. But I also, part of what I was trying to say was that um, the, that the, the, some of the basic principles that Dr. King talked about, which played itself out through the global imagination of the New Left, hadn't died. They actually continued to exist. And in fact, you all are the inheritors of that. And you've inherited that and built on it in some significant ways. That doesn't answer all the questions, but thank goodness it's not my job to answer all the questions. <laughs> so thank you. Please have one more kind of round of applause for our speaker, Robin Kelly. <laughs> so our formal time is over, but I invite you all to talk, uh, um, uh, talk amongst yourselves. Also ask uh, Professor Kelly any questions that we couldn't uh, have answered in the question and answer period. And please also, again, there are books, uh, a few books of Professor Kelly in the back that you should uh, check out. Uh, and finally, to thank Alternative Radio for uh, taping the event. Have a good evening.